My name is Martin Kleppmann. Um, yes, I'm about to start a postdoc looking at encrypted database systems um, at Cambridge. But this talk is not about that. Um, so this talk is very much about a few things that I've learned over the past few years, um, building large-scale data systems at LinkedIn and then uh, writing this book here for O'Reilly, which is looking at the, the architecture of data systems in, in a very broad way and trying to crystallize out the big ideas, the fundamental ideas um, that you get across many different kinds of implementations. So I'd like to start with an analogy, and that is maybe you've seen this before here. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is quite often quoted, um, which kind of tries to observe the, the needs and desires that humans tend to have, where at the top you have kind of the, the high lofty goals of realizing your true self, um, you know, realizing your own identity, and below that, the, your personal self-esteem and so on. But this hierarchy here also makes clear that there's a, a bit of a priority order there, and that is, like, if you are hungry and thirsty and you desperately need some blood sugar, then you probably don't care about your lofty life goals. You just want some food right now. Um, likewise, if you fear for your physical safety, then you're not be going to be worrying about your self-esteem too much. So this is a, a hierarchy where the lower levels need to be satisfied first before you can move on to the higher levels. And the higher levels are super important, though, but uh, you can't do without the lower ones. And so I was thinking a bit, musing, what would a similar kind of hierarchy look like for an organization that is trying to do interesting things with data, maybe being data-driven. And so I was thinking, well, at the top, you still have some kind of vision, some kind of grand mission of what your organization is trying to achieve, doing something positive for the world. But, well, how do you actually implement that? You, I guess you need some kind of products. You need some things that people will find useful, which is the way how you realize your vision and your big ideas. But then, in order to actually make those products, assuming this is working with data, uh, there's got to be some kind of analysis and processing and data munging that goes on. So that's the layer we call data science, and that's, again, a prerequisite for making these products. But that's not all yet, So, In order to do interesting data analysis work, well, you've first got to have some kind of infrastructure on which you can actually perform your computations. Maybe this is a Hadoop cluster or Spark or whatever people are using nowadays. But even that's not it yet, because fundamentally, a Hadoop cluster is worth absolutely nothing if there's no data in it. So really, the foundation here is simply being able to access the data that you need for the, the types of products you're trying to build. That's really the foundation on which all of this sits, the, the food and water without which you can't operate. And you'd think that just simply getting hold of data ought to be a solved problem by today, but it really doesn't seem to be. Uh, it really seems to be still harder than, than it ought to be because in a larger organization, you end up with data being spread across many, many different systems. So you have various online databases which are maybe serving a website, for example. Some of them might be relational, some of them might be non-relational. You've got various logs being produced at various places, which maybe they're files on disk, or maybe they're syslog streams or whatever. You've got message queues, which are getting, uh, processing jobs, sending them to background workers. Maybe you've got search indexes for full text search. Maybe you've got monitoring systems, and so on. And so all of these things tend to normally not talk to each other very much. They end up being these individual silos, unless you do a whole lot of work to somehow wire them up and connect them up. But the, the tools for doing so are really not very good at the moment. But I can see you thinking already, hang on, we, we heard this story before. This is just like data warehouses in the 1990s. So it's saying, OK, we should take all of the data from all of these various online processing systems and put it all in a central place so that our analysts can do useful things with it. And the way you get all of this data into a central place would be through some kind of ETL process. And that is, you 
first of all, extract data from the source databases. So these are some kind of um, front-end databases, maybe which are handling actual requests from customers, and maybe once a day, you do a dump of the entire database, and you load it through this ETL pipeline, and that is, the next step is then you transform it. That's quite useful because um, often the schema in which is suitable for handling low latency online requests is different from the kind of form of data that you might want for analytic purposes. So it makes sense to have some translation process there in the middle, and then finally you would load it into a data warehouse or a Hadoop cluster or so. And this is all very familiar stuff. So these ideas have been around since early 1990s when Ralph Kimple and folks like that were um, building up this idea of data warehouses in enterprises. Of course, things have developed since then. And so I guess the most interesting development there over the years has been the emergence of, of Hadoop and the Spark and the various tooling around it. And the biggest changes I see there in this step of historical evolution here, uh, well, firstly, generally data warehouses are uh, built around a relational data model, which is exactly what you want for many business analytics, business intelligence type tasks. But it's not everything. There, there is data that doesn't neatly fit into a relational model. Um, and some people call this unstructured or semi-structured data basically anything that's not relational. And so widening the scope so that those types of data can be carried along as well is one of the major things that Hadoop did for people. The other big thing that's changed here in, in this historical evolution is, I think, the flexibility and programmability of these systems. So if what you want is just to do a SQL query on a star schema, um, with a fact table and some dimension tables and get back some aggregates, then really data warehouses do that really nicely. But that's not everything that you might want to do with data. You might want to like train a recommendation system, run data through some machine learning uh, algorithms. Maybe you want to build full text search indexes. Maybe you just want some completely custom analysis. And these kind of things don't, are not really well done in a purely relational model. For this, you just need to be able to write arbitrary code in a real programming language. And that's another thing that Hadoop and first MapReduce and now Spark let people do is really open up the platform so that you can run your own code on this data. But of course, the world didn't stop in 2008, so things have developed further. And the, the main thing that has come in with, with the new kind of breed of streaming data systems is that we've moved away from a kind of batch style of thinking towards continuously processing data as it comes in, which means the end-to-end -end delay of getting results can be much lower then. So rather than taking your entire database dump at the end of a day and loading it into another system and then getting your reports the next day, these things could have latencies of like a second or so. So really reducing down the amount of time that, that data takes to flow through these systems. In this context, I'd like to talk a little bit about Kafka. I imagine a lot of you know about Kafka already. Would you mind saying? Yeah? Cool. So I'll, I'll give just a very brief summary for those who've not seen it before. Uh, so it's an open source project, came out of LinkedIn originally, um, is uh, now developed at Apache. And the idea of Kafka is that it's, it's similar to message brokers, similar like what you might get with JMS or AMQP style brokers, um, with some interesting differences, as I'll point out. Uh, so really, it deals with streams of events. And an event in this case is really just acknowledging the fact that something happened. It's a small amount of data which just somehow encodes something that happened in the world. And the stream here simply means that if you are a process in a system and you want to find out when something happened in the world, you can subscribe to it. And the system will notify you whenever one of these events occurs. That's really all it is. So a typical kind of event you might get would be like a line in a web server log. So this is 
uh, indicating the fact that something happened. And the thing that happened is that a certain client IP address at a certain time requested a certain URL and it got a certain response code and there's a browser user agent string and so on. So just in, as an example, this is what an event could look like. And if you're working with Kafka now, um, you've got these streams which are these, these ordered lists of events. And the only thing you can do is to simply stick your event at the end. You append it at the end of one of these topic partitions. And now anyone who's interested in finding out what events have occurred, they follow along this stream. It's a bit like a tail dash F in a Unix file uh, where if somebody's appending to a file, then another process can watch that and see all the changes that are being made to that file. Uh, Kafka works in a very similar way, except it's distributed across multiple machines and fault tolerant and replicated and so on. So I talked about the type of event you can get could be like a line of logs from a web server. And that's certainly one type of thing. Or another type of activity event would be like a user clicked a certain button at a certain time. And this is useful stuff to record. And these kinds of events, they're just kind of like a freestanding thing, like uh, an immutable piece of information saying this thing happened at this time. There are other types of events we could record as well. One that I find quite interesting is you could use sensor data in this kind of way as well. So if you've got a sensor attached to some piece of machinery, it will typically produce readings in some regular time interval and send those readings as ticks into some system. And the, the fact that at a certain point in time, the sen sensor reading uh, was X, that's an event. And we can go still further here. It doesn't need to be just these kind of activity events, but this actually applies to databases as well. And that is, every time somebody writes something to a database, every time I update or insert or delete something in a database, that's a change that happened. So that change to the data in the database is, again, an event that can be recorded and sent to a system like Kafka. So this is maybe a bit counterintuitive if you're used to thinking in the kind of JMS style of message queues, but with Kafka, this works really well. So I wrote this little piece of open source software called Bottled Water, uh, which is just kind of trying out this approach for Postgres. So it's currently limited only to Postgres as a source database. And what it does is uh, this is like a little um, a daemon client that you connect to Postgres and you install a little plugin in the Postgres server. And it does two things. The first thing is when you start it up, it takes a consistent snapshot of the entire contents of the database and it sends all of those out to Kafka. So every row in the database becomes a message in Kafka and every table in the database becomes a topic in Kafka. So it does that as a one-off thing, capturing this snapshot. And then it follows the write ahead log. And now every time somebody inserts or updates or deletes something in the database, those also become events. And they also get sent into Kafka as events. And now this means that anyone who wants can subscribe to the stream of events in Kafka and get notified any time somebody writes something to the database. And more than that, because we wrote the entire snapshot of the entire database to Kafka in the first place, there's actually a copy of the complete database sitting there in Kafka. So if you want to build a search index, for example, um, so that you can do full text search on, on the contents of your database, you can do that. You can just consume from Kafka and it'll be kept up to date all of the time because every write to the source database will end up in there as well. Um, but it's also going to be complete. And the final thing this does is talk to an Avro schema registry. So it uses a serialization format called Avro for encoding the data. And I'll talk about that more in a little minute. But the general principle here that we're seeing is that you're getting all these various different sources of data, which can be like logs of activity that's happening. There might be sensor data and there might be change log data from databases. And all of these can be fed into Kafka, which makes, them, which makes Kafka kind of this like central place, uh, a kind of hub 
where all of the streams of data end up. And so if you want to get access to some data, you can get it from Kafka, and you don't need to um, like go through a whole lot of integration work because it provides a kind of standardized interface that you can just hook into. In fact, it gives you a really good way also if you want to do ETL into a data warehouse or into Hadoop. Kafka gives you a really neat way of doing this because for a database, for example, you know, we did the consistent snapshot and we did the ongoing stream of changes. So you can just take those and load them into HDFS, for example. And this works really nicely, actually. It means you don't need to do that once a day dump of the entire database. You can just keep following the streams and you know, maybe you'll batch it up a little bit just for efficiency purposes, but you can choose how quickly or how slowly you want it loaded into the analytics systems. But also now you've got the data in a stream, there's more you can do. You, know, you can uh, search the logs in real time. Maybe you want to use it for monitoring purposes, driving some dashboards, maybe like for security monitoring as well, so detecting any kind of unusual activity or some kind of real time analytics and so on. So simply having the data available in stream form is incredibly enabling because you can now do all these different things with it. And so that's what I mean with this lowest level of the pyramid. Once you've managed to make the data accessible in a, in a uniform format, in a place where you can just go and help yourself to it, uh, that then enables all of the upper layers so that you can then uh, build hopefully useful products on top of it. Now, I did bottled water for Postgres as kind of a, a first experiment to see what this kind of thing could look like. And our people have been taking it further and saying, okay, we've got this general pattern now of we want to get data from databases and log processing systems and other things into Kafka. And we have a similar thing on the output side, getting it from Kafka back into data, like for example, a full text search index like Elasticsearch, where you might want to search the data. And this general pattern has a few reusable components that, that we tend to need. So Kafka from, I believe, version 0 0.9, which is the upcoming version, uh, will have this new framework called Copycat, which is specializing exactly in this purpose of getting data in and out of Kafka. Uh, it's really cool development, so I'm really excited to see that. If you want to learn more about it, Neha will be giving a talk about this uh, tomorrow, just after lunch, so um, you can learn a lot more about it there. So what I talked about in this lowest level of the pyramid is simply making the data accessible. And if you make it accessible in stream form, you know, that's a real-time form, you can do real-time things with it. But there's still a big question here, and that is, how does the data actually get encoded? What format do you put it in? Because there's a risk here that, um, you know, every team that wants to publish some data to Kafka just chooses the format that they happens to be their favorite format. So like some people really like JSON and they'll put their data, publish their data to Kafka in JSON format. Some people really like XML for some reason and will use that. Maybe some people like protocol buffers or the people like ASN1, whatever. So now you suddenly end up with this mess where although you've got all of the data in one place, if it's in 10 different formats, it's really still difficult to work with. So um, what I recommend very strongly if you're going to try and go in this direction in your organization is to standardize on one format. And it doesn't even matter too much what that format is as long as everyone's using the same format. Because although it's kind of difficult to get everyone, all of the publishers of data to agree on one format, it's even harder to then have publishers in a range of formats and then all of the consumers of the data have to worry about parsing 10 different formats. So you can use JSON for this purpose and it's quite a popular one. Um, the, the appeal of it mainly is that it's very widely supported, of course, and we all know it and uh, uh, you, know, you can work with it from any programming language and it's kind of mostly human readable. Like if you've removed the white space, it's a bit hard to read, but it still classifies as human readable. But what I'd like, you, like to do is to try and convince you at least that there are alternatives to JSON as well, because I think JSON has a few problems. Um, one of these, which is it's maybe not that well known, but it can get really nasty actually, is that 
uh, JSON doesn't really distinguish between integer numbers and floating point numbers. And so you're saying, this is a really arcane nonsense, why should I care about that? Um, you could see an example with Twitter's API, for example. Uh, so Twitter had a, has this API where you can get tweets, and every tweet has a number, an ID. And at some point, the numbers got larger than 2 to the power 53, which happens to be this magical threshold where if you're storing the number in a double precision floating point number, it starts losing precision. And as a result, all of the Twitter clients that were implemented in JavaScript started breaking because their, their tweet IDs were no longer exact. They were like off by a couple. And so like the IDs become completely meaningless at that point. And so they then had to put the IDs in their JSON as strings in addition to numbers to deal with people uh, like not being able to work with numbers larger than two to the power 53. It's just that kind of annoying gotcha, you know, that really you shouldn't have to deal with. Another thing I don't like about JSON is that there's no support for binary strings. So it has support for Unicode strings, which are the kind of human readable strings, but no byte strings, which again is one of those things which you think you don't need until you suddenly do need it, and then you have to encode your binary strings as base64 and it kind of sucks a bit. So finally, JSON is a bit verbose and a bit slow. Um, you know, it's not as bad as XML, but that's a very low bar. So there are, there are very nice binary formats uh, which have nice properties and which are much faster and much more compact. And one of these is Avro that I'd like to talk about, um, which I'm quite a big fan of. Um, there are alternatives like protocol buffers and thrift, which are also widely used. Um, but Avro is an interesting one to look at, I think. So the way you would encode some data in Avro is you first define a schema. And it has the schema language, which looks a bit C-like. Um, or you can use a JSON-based schema language instead. But for example, you want to record page views. That is, every time a user of your website viewed a page. That's an event. And the event has a timestamp, which is like, I don't know, maybe Unix timestamp or so. And it has a URL. And it has a client IP address. And you can see you can define custom data types like an IP address for IPv4 and one for IPv6 or so. Now, the nice thing with a schema is you can put documentation in it. And documentation is really useful because it means that there's a chance that other people who are going to consume this data might have a clue what it means. You know, is that timestamp, is it in seconds resolution or milliseconds or microseconds? There's kind of useful information to know if you want to actually do something with the data. So, you know, although JSON is kind of nice and schema-less and, okay, you can add an optional JSON schema if you want, with something like this, it forces you to have a schema and it really encourages us to have documentation as well. Okay, so that's one thing. But now, what happens if you need to change one of those schemas? Because that happens inevitably. You will never be able to predict all the possible things you might want to put in a, in a record. And so let's say, I don't know, you want to add a session ID field here to the schema. And Avro has a really elegant way of doing schema evolution, it's called. And that, that means being able to change the schema of a record according to certain rules, but it maintains compatibility. And so what you can do here, for example, is you can add a field to a record, no problem. The only requirement is that you add a default value to it. So in this case, you're going to say if the session ID is not present, the default value will be null. And now, if you have these, you can use this for encoding messages that you send to Kafka, for example. The way you would do this is typically by having a registry of schemas. And registry simply means a database, right, which, say, which says, OK, you have this, this version of page view event, and it's associated with a version number of page view event. And then later, if you want to add the session ID, sorry if this is a bit small, but it's just the same schema as on the previous slide. Um, if you want to add the session ID to it, then that would be like version two of the page view event schema. And all the schema do registry does is keep track of these things and assign version numbers to the schemas. And there are open source implementations of this uh, for Kafka, so Confluent open sourced 
um, a very nice implementation of an Afro schema registry, which does precisely this. And now if you have this, what you can, how do you actually encode the data that goes into Kafka? What you would have is, well, in, in Kafka, a message is just a string of bytes. So Kafka doesn't care what kind of serialization format. It doesn't enforce any data model. Um, so it's up to you to uh, choose some serialization. But if you're using the schema registry and the associated serializer, it simply does a compact binary encoding of the fields you want, which is, in this case, here the timestamp and the URL and the IP address. And it just prefixes that with the version number of the schema. Uh, it just takes a few extra bytes, but now the message contains the information of exactly which version of the schema it was encoded with. And so now, in a system where you have various people producing data to Kafka and various other people consuming data from Kafka again, they can figure out what schema the data is actually encoded with, and it can evolve gradually over time. The way this works is now that, say you want to produce some data in a new version of the schema, the producer will first register that schema with the registry and thus get a version number, and that version number is then included in any of the messages that it sends. And likewise, on the consumer end, if you see a message with a schema version number that you don't know yet, you can just ask the schema registry, hey, can I have that schema version number, please? And then you know how to decode it. And because of the way that Avro can do schema evolution, this works very nicely for, for gradual upgrades of producers and consumers. So for example, imagine you've got a version two of the schema that you've just deployed, and you deploy it first to the consumers of the data. So the producers are still on the old version one, but the consumers are on the new version two. And that's totally fine, because if you, uh, if you stick with the rules for schema evolution in Avro, it remains backwards compatible. So if you've added a new field in version two, for example, well, the version one producers won't be putting that field in there because they don't know that that field exists. So the version two consumers, they will simply fill, and fill in that field with a default value. That's what the default is for. But the nice thing is that you can swap it around as well and you can say, okay, I'm actually going to upgrade my producers first and then my consumers. And so this is now forward compatibility. That is, the old consumers can still read the messages even though they were written with a more recent version of the schema. And again, the way this works, if a new field is added, for example, so the schema, uh, sorry, the session ID field is added in version two, well, the consumers on version one will simply ignore that field. So it does exactly what you'd expect. And because you have this forward and backward compatibility, you can mix the versions in a very flexible way. So there's no need to kind of upgrade things in lockstep or so. You can just upgrade little bits of the system as and when they want to. Uh, and this is, this is really great for operational purposes. So this is what a schema, a schema registry gives us using an encoding format like Avro. It defines some kind of assignment of version numbers to schemas so that you just need to include the version number in every message. It can do some compatibility checking for you, which is really useful so that you don't accidentally screw it up and make a backwards incompatible change. So the schema registry can be configured to only let you register a new schema if it meets the compatibility rules. And then finally, documentation, as I said, is just really useful way to have the descriptions of all of the data formats in your entire organization in one place. So you know what data formats actually exist and who's producing which data, who's responsible for it, and what's the meaning of fields, what are the semantics? So this is another really important part of making the data accessible. You know, it's not just enough to just have a bunch of bytes in Kafka, but you need to know the meaning of those bytes as well. And so having these evolvable schemas is a very nice way to implement uh, that kind of universal access to the data. Now once we have these things, now we can start building systems on top of this and composing these various different ideas together. So in this system that I showed earlier here, we've got data coming in from various sources and all being encoded in the same format and data then flowing out to various different consumers. Now you can have these intermediate stages as well. These are stream processors 
which will take one stream and maybe transform it a bit, do some processing on it, like maybe run a classifier on it, um, which has been trained on some data set offline. Um, maybe it'll do some aggregations, like count how many things of a certain thing happened. Uh, maybe it'll join several streams together. But the output of these are just more streams. So you can now start building these whole pipelines of streams feeding into stream processors, feeding into more streams. And you can build these systems in, in, in a very flexible, very loosely coupled way. The streams just kind of act as this connection point between different parts of the system. And so this applies, it applies in kind of a technical sense where there's one like stream processing job producing some output that another stream processing job will consume. And because you standardized on a data format, they can talk to each other. But it kind of applies on an organization level even. So you can see now Kafka plus ske some schema management as, uh, you could call it a stream data platform, for example. It's really this kind of central hub where everyone can come to exchange their data and share their streams. So you can have team A, for example, in an organization which maybe operates some front-end web servers and some uh, online databases, and they're not actually going to consume anything. They're just pure producers. They're going to emit like activity logs of what page views are happening, that gets sent out to Kafka, and if they manage databases, then maybe the change logs of those databases, every write to those databases, can also get sent as a stream to Kafka. And from that point onwards, they've basically handed it off to the rest of the organization. So another team that wants to consume it can just do so. They don't need to specially ask for permission, except for maybe access control uh, purposes if there's like authentication required. But you know, they don't have to like write extra code to integrate with this other team system. They have this shared communication channel where they can just take the streams produced by another team. They can, this team B can now consume these streams and maybe combine them, maybe do some processing, maybe write something to a database on the side as well and produce new output streams. And similarly, this can now feed into more teams. So, you know, maybe there's another team which will take data uh, that's appearing in stream form and present it in a way uh, through some kind of dashboards to users again, for example, and so on. So you can have these various teams which are actually using these streams in Kafka as a communication channel. I think this is a very powerful way of building systems. So I'm very happy to talk about this more. If you're interested in a bit more background reading, here's uh, a list of links I've put together with some, some blog posts which talk about this general area. Also, um, just after this talk, I'm going to be giving office hours over at, in the Expo Hall at the O'Reilly booth. Um, so we can go there straight after this talk and uh, we'll just sit around the table. Anyone who wants to come and just discuss anything about streaming data or so, I'd be very happy to come and discuss these things with you. And finally, um, this book, uh, there's a discount code for anyone who wants the ebook. Um, so, so far, eight chapters are available online and you can find it at dataintensive.net. Uh, but I will also be giving away free copies. So, O'Reilly have kindly printed out a bunch of paper copies. So, even though the the book is not actually finished yet, but of the chapters we have so far, um, they, they've got them on paper and I'll be giving those away tomorrow afternoon um, and signing them for anyone who wants as well. So you can get the book there. I believe I still have a few minutes for questions, so maybe we can do that here and then uh, after five minutes or so we can go up into office hours. Yes, please. Yes, absolutely. So the question was, uh, how is Kafka different from JMS or other kind of message brokers? So the biggest difference is actually in the way that it's implemented internally, but though that actually has some important effects for how you use it in applications. So with um, normal message queues, the deal is that uh, you send a message to the broker and the broker will try to deliver it to a consumer, and it will track whether the consumer has acknowledged that message or not. 
and if the consumer dies or something, then the broker will re-deliver that message to another consumer, and so that way you make sure that you don't lose messages, which is fine, except that this means that the ordering of messages is lost, because you can have a whole bunch of messages being delivered, um, being processed in parallel, and then some of them fail to acknowledge, so they'll get re-delivered, so they basically jump to a different point in time. And that is really not what you want if your messages represent database data. So if your messages are changed data in a database, then the ordering of messages is really important because uh, you know, whether you first write A and then B, uh, or first B and then A matters because the final outcome is going to be different. And so how Kafka works internally is much more like the transaction log of a database, actually, in that it maintains these things called partitions, uh, which is like the, the unit at which um, the streams are produced and consumed. And each partition is just totally append only and total ordered. And uh, this, this model makes, uh, makes actually consuming these streams a lot more efficient as well, because it means the only way you need to consume these streams is to actually read sequentially along this stream. And the broker doesn't need to track acknowledgements for like which message has been processed and which hasn't. The only thing a consumer needs to know is it's offset in a partition. And so it just remem the consumer remembers, oh, I've seen messages up to offset one, two, three, and then it reads another two, and then I see, oh, I've seen messages up to offset one, two, five. And periodically it checkpoints those offsets. Um, but it means that this, this sequential consumption model um, it works really well for the semantics when you want ordering, uh, but it's also super efficient as well. The only downside really is that each partition has to be sequentially consumed, so you can't share the consuming of one partition amongst several consumers. Um, so that's why I wouldn't necessarily use this for a job queue type thing where what you're wanting is some jobs that are expensive to process to be farmed out. For that, something like JMS is still perfect. Um, but Kafka works really nicely in the situations where processing each individual message is really quick because all you need to do is write it to a database or increment a counter or something like that. And so it's perfectly feasible for a single threaded process to just churn through one partition. Then you just spread the various partitions amongst various machines in the cluster. So you parallelize it that way. Long answer, I'm afraid. Any more? Yes, please. Um, sorry, why does, what does Kafka give you at least once delivery? Yeah. Or? So, why would things be duplicated at all? There are, so the question was why could things get duplicated in this kind of architecture? Um, there are several ways it could be. So, imagine, for example, that you're a producer, you're a front end web server, and you're sending messages to Kafka, and now the network connection goes down for some reason, like somebody unplugs the wrong network cable. And now, well, you didn't know. So at some point, you simply, the TCP connection dies and you don't know what has actually been published or not. So for the things that you got an acknowledgement back, you know that they've ended up in Kafka, but maybe some additional messages that were in flight have got published, but maybe not. You simply don't know. And so in that situation, the publisher then has to retry and send those again. But it means that there's this little interval of time during which some messages might have got sent twice. So that's just one example. Or another thing that can happen on the consumer side is um, these, I was saying the consumers track their offset of how far they've read each partition. And typically it won't write that offset to stable storage after every single message because that would get really expensive. It'll just write it, I don't know, maybe once a minute or so. And that's called checkpointing. And so that means now if a consumer suddenly dies unexpectedly and it comes back up again, it'll resume processing at its last checkpoint, but that it might have actually uh, processed some more messages before it died since that last checkpoint, but those will get processed a second time then. So there's some really interesting work going on uh, adding exactly once guarantees to Kafka by means of a transaction protocol. Um, so this is, it's very much in development and not production ready yet, but some people are working on it. I think that's a super exciting development for the future. 
Yes, please. Do you have one port from a copy? Is there a scenario where you have to remove things from a copy? Is a scenario where you have to remove things from a topic? Um, so that you could think about this different ways. So if, if it's simply too, too big for storage purposes, um, you could rebalance just amongst brokers. So that's kind of a simple, simple way if it's just a matter of disk space. It's kind of a bit trickier if, um, for example, you logged some sensitive data and then you realize, oh, we shouldn't have logged that, and now you have to somehow purge that data from your system. Is that the kind of thing you're thinking of? Yes. Okay, yes. Yeah, so the question is if you have just, if you're just keeping data for a certain amount of time, say one month, um, what do you do if, if a consumer falls far further behind than one month? Um, a simple thing you could do there is just archive it all to HDFS. And so then you can work with uh, the data in Hadoop and keep it there for as, as long as you want. Okay, so I think we should uh, say time is up. Thank you very much all for coming. And Maybe see some of you at the office hours. <laughs>